<laughs> Will you see the moo cows? No. No. So it's August 19th and I finally finished another book yesterday. So I knew this was going to happen. I went back to work from my vacation on the 16th, which was Monday. It's now Thursday. So yesterday I completed finally another book. I knew I was going to slow way down because obviously while you're working, can't be reading all the time. Um, but I did, I was able to listen to an audiobook this week while I was driving for work. And um, so I finished Why We're Polarized by Ezra Klein, which I've been wanting to listen to for a long time. Um, I first heard about this book on Courtney Farrader's channel and she uh, read it and reviewed it and it really sounded like it would be right up my alley. So Ezra Klein is a political reporter type person. He's also the founder of Vox. Um, and so he wrote this book. It's all about you know, why the American political system is so toxic, why as a country we've become so polarized, particularly in the last like 50 or 60 years since the 1960s. Um, and it was fascinating. It was really, really fascinating. And um, Ezra Klein reads it himself on the audiobook. So I very much recommend that if you like listening to audiobooks and if you particularly like nonfiction and political type, social type audiobooks, I definitely recommend it. Um, there was so much in there that I learned. And as a person who's fairly, um, at least since the Obama years, has become much more politically um, interested and listen to political podcasts and that sort of thing. Um, there was a lot in there that I just didn't know about. And um, particularly, I thought this is something I thought um, somebody might be interested in. I know Doris has been really interested in this particular topic is when the um, parties, the Democrat the Democrat and the Republican Party sort of switched agendas because the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln, was the party that freed the slaves, the Emancipation Proclamation, all of that, was sort of known as the party that was more um, about civil rights. And then all of a sudden, there it's the opposite. The Democrats, since the 1960s, have been the party that's been known to be more for civil rights. And how did that happen? And this book really describes that switch over um, it has a lot to do with the Southern Dixiecrats and what they were doing um, in terms of sort of uh, keeping a stranglehold on the political system in the early part of the 20th century. That was all really fascinating. Um, also fascinating to understand how the American political system has been sort of based on all these um, sort of gentlemen's agreements or ways of doing things that were not actually rules but just were... Um, how things had always been done and and that was what allowed the system to sort of work um, because people were constantly making these compromises but it was sort of 
accepted these norms um, in the system were sort of accepted, like the whole idea that even if your party is not in power, you're probably going to pass the president's um, the president's nominee for Supreme Court because the president is, you know, sort of in charge of nominating somebody for the Supreme Court and how that all blew up under um, Obama. And when Mitch McConnell refused to hold a hearing on Merrick Garland to fill the Supreme Court seat that was emptied when Anton Scalia unexpectedly died, right? All of that happened. And it makes liberals and Democrats like minds want to blow up because it pisses us off so much. And Ezra Klein does a really great job of saying, yeah, it makes us mad, but honestly, that was the most rational thing for Mitch McConnell to do. Like, why would he ever um, make it happen that the Supreme Court justice of his opponent get in, you know, get appointed? Like, it wasn't rational for Mitch McConnell to do that. And so even though that had been the norm for 100 years or more than that, that you always, you know, have a hearing on the president's nominee and eventually confirm somebody that they pick, um, he, like it was just a norm and there was he didn't break any rules Mitch McConnell didn't break any rules as much as it makes us angry if you're a liberal democrat that he didn't you know hold a hearing on Merrick Garland he didn't break any rules and so there's all of these things like that in the American political system that if you're not going to like be polite <laughs> and sort of follow the social norms you can completely derail the whole system and make it so nothing ever works and that was just absolutely fascinating to have him go through that and how we are in a period of time where because Americans are so polarized um, and because people have decided that they no longer need to go, they get rewarded by being reelected, by not following those norms and by doing what the people that are the most polarized want them to do. They're going to just continue to do that. And so it's only going to get worse. Um, it was an eye opening book. And so I highly recommend it. If any of that sounds interesting to you, I highly recommend the book. Um, and I was super glad to have read it. So that makes me, um, my total at this point is 16 books for the month. It is day eight, day 19. Sorry, is it the 19th? Yes, it's day 19. 16 book read, 19 days, trying to get to 20. So let's see how it goes. Friday, August 20th, and I finished my 17th book of the month. That is An African in Greenland by Tete Michelle Pomasi. Um, and this is translated from the French uh, by, let's see if I can find the translator, by James Kirkup. And this is uh, a book that I read for a book naturalist book club, so I don't want to go into it too much here. Um, because I'll be doing filming a separate review video uh, for this book and for our other pick for the month of August. So, um, but suffice it to say, just for a brief summary, this is um, Pomasi's tale of traveling from his native land in Africa. He was from Togo and as a young teenager decides that he really wants to go to Greenland. So he works his way up the African coast for six years and then gets to France and um, finds some benefactors and then finally fulfills his dream of going to Greenland and spends um, over a year, almost two years in Greenland, living with native people and learning their ways. And it is a fascinating, fascinating story. Um, it's nonfiction, it's his memoir of his time uh, traveling through Greenland and um, the time leading up to him getting to Greenland and what he went through. Um, and it is, it's just really, it's really a great, great, um, a great narrative. So I won't go into it too much here because like I said, I want to do a, a full review for the book Naturalist. Um, but if you like travel memoirs or nature writing about cold places, um, 
definitely pick this up. I will say, uh, just for a warning, there is um, some difficult stuff having to do with animals, particularly the sled dogs that live in Greenland that um, is not American cultural norms for how to treat animals. So just be aware of that if you go into this book so that you're not shocked by it. Anyway, um, so yeah, 17 books so far uh, in the month of August. Really, really pleased with my progress. Like I said in my last check-in, things have slowed way, way down because I had to work this week, but it is Friday. Um, and so I don't have too much going on this weekend. So I'm hoping to pick up and get a couple more books read this weekend. It's August 21st and I've finished another book. So last night, um, well, early this morning, I was suffering from insomnia. So I got up and read for a while and I completed um, Ross Gay's uh, The Book of Delights. And that is a collection of essays. I was reading it on my, uh, I was reading the ebook so I could read it, you know, easily at night with uh, my iPad all lit up. And I really, really enjoyed this. It's a collection of short essays. Most of the essays are only like one or two pages long. And it, in it, like throughout one year, Ross Gay um, talks about things that he finds just regular, everyday, normal things that he finds delightful. So it might be flowers that he sees it might be a little child it might be you know uh going to a coffee shop and sitting there with a nice drink and reading a book you know just all these things so he is a poet normally and i think this is his first nonfiction collection um but so the essays read quite there's quite a lot of poetic language in it um one thing that i did find that was a little bit confusing at times is he is <laughs> a fan of the run on sentence. So sometimes, you know, it would, his words would get tangled up and I'd have to like go back and read more slowly. But overall, I found it quite easy to read and really um, delightful. Like just like the title says, I will say Ross uh, Gay is a black American man and he does not shy away from talking about um, the casual racism that he experiences or what it's like to live in America as a black person and the violence that's perpetrated against black people in America. So like those things get woven into his essays, but in a way in which it's not the main focus, if you understand what I'm meaning, like he doesn't dismiss those things or n not talk about those things, but he weaves them into the things that he finds delightful in a way that makes sense. So I really appreciated that a lot. Like I said, this takes place over one year. And so they're not daily essays, but they're like, they're um, dated. So you know when he wrote them. So yeah, overall, really enjoyed it. Would highly recommend this collection of essays. <laughs>